Hi, this is Val Hart, the real Dr. Doolittle, and today I'm talking with Laurel Nimi. She is camped in the Kalahari. She's investigated walrus carcasses on Alaska's Bering Sea beaches, and she's gotten lost in the Amazon jungle with the Brazilian Federal Police. Can't wait to hear about that story. (laughs) (laughs) Happy to share it. (laughs) Oh, good. She's worked with Interpol's Wildlife Crime Working Group the St. Louis Zoo, the American Museum of Natural History, along with many other universities, and she has more than a decade of experience as a consultant working in over a dozen African countries where she's been fated with chickens by villagers and shared stories with rangers on the frontiers of wildlife poaching. She consults on wildlife and natural resource management and also serves as a fellow on the University of Vermont's Institute for Environmental Diplomacy and Security. And she is the author of a wonderful book called Animal Investigators, How the World's First Wildlife Forensics Lab is Solving Crimes and Saving Endangered Species. It has a great foreword by Richard Lakey and has been endorsed by Jane Goodall and many others. It is a CSI for wildlife that has been featured on ABC News Nightline, C-SPAN, and NPR's Science Friday. And she also hosts The Wildlife, which is a weekly radio show that explores the mysteries of the animal world through interviews with scientists and other wildlife investigators. Welcome, Laurel. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Val. I'm delighted. Uh, Your topic is totally fascinating. I know CSI kind of took the world, the the TV shows really kind of took the world by storm. You know, they're very, very popular. But you've taken it and are applying it to endangered species, to wildlife, to uh, tracking down wildlife poachers and smugglers and all kinds of things. I can't even imagine how exciting, thrilling, dangerous, um, and intense your work must be. Well, it's interesting because it's a whole new field of science. And I think what is very attractive to me personally is that people are excited about forensics and thinking about wildlife forensics Mm -hmm. gives kids especially an interest in science and an interest in conservation Mm -hmm. that they probably never had or it gives them another window into this field in a really exciting way and an exciting way where they can make a difference because the field is still so new there's a lot of discovering yet to do and um, Mm -hmm. you only have to sort of blink and it's right there and that's the sad fact on the one hand but it's actually as a professional you get really excited by the work well you know what i find so interesting about what you're doing too i know for myself you know i read stories about uh poachers and you know how they're wiping out entire species just to you know like our elephants just to get their ivory and uh, you name it you know just uh, all over the world you know and how how awful it is, you know, how difficult it is to try to track them and to find them and to stop that, you know, and I feel helpless. But you, uh, you you said in your book, you said, until the early 1980s, wildlife poachers and smugglers had an easy time getting away with murder. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service special agent, um, let's see, uh, who is it, Terry Gross? Correct. uh, Wanted to change that and then and then you got involved, and y'all started pr- working on protecting animals like and elephants and rhinoceroses and, and others whose populations were endangered from hunters and the middlemen seeking to supply ivory and horn and all the other products. Um, and then, and then y- they would track down and try to find people, you know, the ones that were perpetrating the crimes, um, and then they would get so frustrated because they couldn't make the the allegation stick. I mean, they couldn't prosecute um, because they didn't have the evidence or or something else. Can you tell us more about how all this came about? Yeah, because one, um, a problem with wildlife crime and one of the ways that wildlife forensics differs from human forensics is with human forensics, you have one species, homo Mm -hmm. sapiens, Mm -hmm. people. (laughs) And, And if someone's dead they either died um you know naturally or were killed and then the question is you know under what circumstances right with a with an animal say an elephant or a leopard um when you have the animal killed a lot of times it's also processed into a product so Mm -hmm. ivory 
you know, you might have a dead elephant, but you also have its tusks being processed into a host of consumable products. It's the mm. same with Tibetan antelope uh, being processed, in, you know, for its fur into chatou yeah. shawls and so on and uh-huh. so forth. So that by the time um, you catch the trafficker who is selling or uh, buying and selling these items, mm-hmm. the the evidence is so far distant from the actual site of the killing. Mm. And to be able to tell whether or not a crime has been committed depends on the species involved. So something like a turkey feather would be legal to possess and make into a you know necklace, but an eagle feather would not be yeah. legal. Yeah. You know, fur from cashmere goats, fine to weave into a shawl. Tibetan antelope fur, not okay. Mm. So it really depends on the species. But when you, all you have is a product you know, some trinket or some piece of clothing or a pair of boots, it's hard to tell what that animal is, and that's where the forensics Wow. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, so you could actually look at the the product that it became and could tell if it was an eagle or a turkey feather or a, or something like that. You you can tell that? Um, when you say you, I'm going to generalize the scientists okay. as a... <laughs> okay. You personally, get your, mic, get your magnifying glass and your... your but that's little... what they do. That's what these scientists do, is a piece of okay. evidence comes in, mm-hmm. and they have to figure out what kind of species, what kind of animal it came from. Ah. Because, like I said, some animals are protected and others are not. So the mm-hmm. answer to that, what is okay. it question, okay. um, becomes really important. So yeah. for feathers, there's a forensic ornithologist whose name is Pepper Trail. Cool. Um, <laughs> and he's um, he's brilliant. So he'll look at the feather and, and he can tell... Uh, he may or may not be able to tell. It depends on the species. Mm-hmm. So if you just have a feather... Mm-hmm. identification becomes a lot harder than if you have, say, the whole bird, because yeah. probably a lot of your listeners are bird watchers, right? <laughs> I'm sure we love <laughs> birds. We love birds. birds. Yes. Yes. And when you when you look at a bird, you have a lot to go on. You yeah. have, um, you know, first of all, you know where you physically are seeing the bird, so you have its geographic location, you have the whole body, you have its plumage pattern, you have um, you can listen to its song, you can see it fly and see how it flies, you can see what it's eating. So you have all this information, but a forensic ornithologist often just has a single feather. Wow. And, and birds, you'll never guess how many feathers a bird has. Oh. I mean, it's amazing. Two to ten thousand feathers. Oh, wow! And an average about no five thousand feathers. Wow. And so some of those feathers might be what they call diagnostic. You know, have diagnostic characteristics, meaning something unique to that species. Okay. And other feathers, say like body feathers on the chest, may not have those same characteristics. Oh, so. Okay. When you have a piece of evidence, say, you know, a necklace or something with some beautiful feathers, you may or may not have the feathers that can identify the species. Mm-hmm. Now, if you do, then you need to, you know, you narrow it down based on the size of the feather, what you know all about the birds, mm-hmm. and, and then you match it with reference specimens. Okay. Wow. So it's, so it's quite a process. It is. <laughs> yeah, very, very complicated. Um Wow. Okay. That's, it's, that's, it's, com- it's complicated, but on the other hand, it's relatively, you know, you take what you know mm-hmm. about a bird. You mm-hmm. know, is it colorful because it's trying to attract mates? Mm-hmm. It, does it camouflage? And you actually, you know, you will already take what you know to start narrowing down your choices. Okay. And I think people find when I lecture on this topic and speak on this topic that they actually know a fair bit and can narrow down I mean, maybe not to the specific species, but they can narrow down choices pretty well. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, okay, so that helps us give a little insight into the the complexity of the task. Um, let's talk for just a moment about the big business of wildlife trafficking itself. Help us understand how how does this what what's the impact of this? Do do you have some of that? Yeah, it's it's interesting because people often. Um, asked me what I, in researching my book, Animal Investigators, what surprised me the most. And uh-huh. two things. One is the size of the black market in wildlife okay. trade. And the second thing is 
the number of species that are affected. Okay. <laughs> so okay. they're very related. related. Yeah. And, of course, you don't really know the size of the market because traffickers and poachers aren't re- reporting sales figures. Yeah. <laughs> that's not part of their duty. So thing. take take my, you know, that's uh-huh. my way of saying, take my figures with a complete grain of salt. <laughs> yes, it's our best guesstimate based okay. on what but, we know. Um, uh-huh. But, you know, it's definitely big business. Um, yeah. People think it's estimated, it's worth an estimated $20 billion, that's with a B, okay. billion dollars annually, and ranks behind drugs and human trafficking Wow! as the third largest black market crime in the world. Wow. And the the problem is, you had asked about the impact, and the problem is it's really plundering species at a time when they're already under threat mm-hmm. from yeah. habitat loss and global climate change. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, lay that on top of the fact that nobody's trafficking in sparrows. You know, yeah. the more... <laughs> Not unless they're four-legged feline. Uh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <yes. laughs> But they're not selling it, at least not that no, we No, at least they're not profiting other than a full belly. Uh, that's a little different. Yeah, but, yeah. But okay. for, for, for us human types, you know, yeah. the more rare the animal, mm-hmm. the more likely someone wants it, mm-hmm. and the more likely, you know, the more yeah. willing someone is to kill it and sell it. Yes. Oh, and so you're biasing toward this impact, and okay. um, so that's that's sort of the problem. There are some species that are under threat specifically because of trade in their parts, um, wow. you know, tigers and rhinos, but uh, but there's a lot which are sort of on the brink. And actually, a new study just came out from the University of Adelaide that is saying that one in five uh, one in five mammals are affected, are on the brink of extinction with over mm. half at a tipping point. And they looked at 95 mammals. Mm. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, and I've heard one in eight before. So, you know, mm-hmm. clearly there's a lot of mammals under threat of extinction from a whole host of, con- you know, causes. But wildlife trafficking yeah. is just one more factor. Yeah, and it's a major one. To, yeah. Yeah, and a major one for certain species. Right, right. Oh God! It just makes my heart sad, and oh. it does. It does, and it can be very overwhelming. But I think, yeah, how come I don't stay so depressed? Because <laughs> it is, you know, it, it is question. very depressing. Yeah. Yeah. Is is because I think that the science and what's being done to counter that is really remarkable, and I think yeah. the more people who know about it, mm-hmm. and the more you recognize what you can do just okay. in terms both of awareness and what you buy, you can actually make a difference and you really can have an impact okay. so, on so tell species. Us. So tell us what we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> tell us everything. Well. <laughs> tell us everything. Go ahead. Uh, uh, here's the microphone. Just speak into the mic. Uh, so you said science counters it. It's helping us counter it. And then we need to be aware. We need to educate ourselves. Um, be aware. Um, and so let's talk about both of those things. So, right. So on the science side, mm-hmm. it used to be, like you said earlier in the in the introduction, that traffickers were getting away with murder. And I guess I should also clarify: there's I'm I talk about poachers and traffickers separately. So to me, okay. poachers are the ones that are illegally killing the animals. Yeah, and Traffickers are the ones selling it yeah. and profiting from it. And a lot of times the poachers are traffickers, but a lot of times they're separate. And more and more they're separate and with the higher um, valued mm-hmm. products, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they're not only separate, but they're huge networks of traffickers. Mm. And they're hiring poachers to do their dirty work. Exactly. Sort of, you know, very similar to organized crime and drugs and, yeah. you know, it's it's no not really different than the other no. types of black no. crimes and, that you hear and, about. Yeah, and, I, you know, I like how uh, how you're terming it also. This is murder. You know, and so the same thing, you know, organized crime has little regard for, you know, human de- decency and value and, and, and stuff, you know, trafficking in humans, for God's sakes, you know, and 
and the drugs and all the other stuff. Um, and, and sometimes killing. You know, they, they murder people, and we get upset about that. Uh, but we should also be upset that they're actually murdering our fellow species that share this planet with us, right? And those are sentient beings uh, that are being hunted just because they happen to possess or grow some part of their anatomy, you know, that, uh, that somebody decided that they wanted. Um, and so it's it's it also a interesting that a lot of times the very thing they're valued for mm-hmm. is the very thing that's unique in the ecosystem oh. or that's, of you know, of value to the broader world. So, you know, you just take a leopard because I have a calendar on my wall mm-hmm. and the picture of the month is a leopard. Just, uh-huh. No, uh-huh. but um, so, you know, it's beautiful spotted coat keeps it camouflaged and makes it successful in the ecosystem. And as an apex predator, it's very important uh, within the ecosystem to maintain balance. And that coat, which helps its success, yeah, and its teeth, which also help its success in being, you know, very broad and robust and able to kill in one bite. Yeah. Um, those two things are exactly the parts that are trafficked mm. and desired. Mm. And it, and you can go through through different um, products, and it's often often the case that wow. some of the most valuable. <sighs> Things for nature, (laughs) you know. Yeah. Well, and you said you have a real special place in your heart for wolverines and tigers. Right. (laughs) So so we're touching on the topic of tigers. So why is that? What what is it about tigers and wolverines that make make them special to you? Well, part of it is because um, because they're they're the school mascots. <laughs> so I went to University of Michigan for undergrad and for my master's, and they're the Wolverines, and uh, Princeton for my PhD, and so that's the Tigers. Oh, but that's what's hysterical. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell us some oh, some incredible <laughs> story about how you personally met a Wolverine and were saved by the Tiger, and I don't know why. I was so excited. <laughs> and they were your school mascot. Oh, you are so funny, Laurel. <laughs> <laughs> but what's, what's interesting, if you think about it, you know, all throughout our own lives, um, you know, from the time we're babies and get our first stuffed animal, you you end up with, um, you know, these mascots of all the sports teams. Yeah. yeah. But mm-hmm. but very rarely is you know does that benefit the actual animal conservation yeah. one one. Um, Contrary example, which is, a, a, I should say, a positive example, is University of Missouri Okay. in Columbia, Missouri, is actually, they're also the Tigers, and they have a whole, um, a whole Tigers for Tigers program where they're helping the conservation and using the fact that they have this mascot and really trying to benefit tigers. And that's mm-hmm. really positive. And maybe your listeners, that's another area where your listeners could really think about it okay. and work toward it because in our own lives we have that all over the place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So. That that makes sense. Wow. Oh, goodness. Okay, so um, lions were my mascot, by the way. <laughs> and... <laughs> Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Okay, um, so um, so science is countering uh, the poachers and the traffickers, which you've helped us understand the difference. Um, so what else do we need to know about that? I, I mean, you wrote this book for a reason, and I'm and you go into a lot of this kind of thing in the book. So let me just, I'm going to back all the way up here and ask you, what in the world got you interested in this, and what led you to write this book? Well, I'd been working in Africa for a long time and okay. going um, back and forth and working on natural resource management and policy. Okay. Um, and one day I was talking to this Tanzanian game warden, actually, okay. and he was telling me about this 10-year-old case where dozens of elephants had been found around watering holes. And they had all died and were missing their ivory tusks. Mm -hmm. And so at first you think, oh, yeah, it's, you know, dead elephant, no tusk. Of course it's poaching. Mm -hmm. But what was weird is none of them had evidence of gunshot wounds. Really? So, yeah. (laughs) So it was the strangest thing. So he was wondering, you know, of course you're thinking poachers, but you're 
you can't prove it. And you're, so you're sort of thinking, well, maybe it's a disease and someone happened along and took the tusk. Yeah, because, found them dead and just took the tusk. Right, which is a different story. And yeah. so he had trained at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service forensics lab Thank and you. with help from this lab had discovered that the source of why the elephants had died was from poison. Uh-huh, okay. And so then he started investigating further and looking for the source of the poison, and he found that pumpkins, which are one of the elephant's favorite foods, uh-huh, okay. had been injected with <gasps> common agricultural chemi- chemicals like pesticides and oh, herbicides. Oh, my God. And then the elephants would eat them and die. Whoa. And... Oh, that just makes me sick. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and... <laughs> And so, and they did that actually for a very good reason. I mean, one, you don't have the sound of the gunshot, but these are really remote places, so nobody would hear it anyway. But also, it's physically a lot easier with poison, the tissues will loosen around the tusk, and so it's easier to remove Uh the tusk when the animal's poisoned. And so, you know, being lazy, no, I'm just kidding, but, you know, it was just physically a lot easier for the poachers to poison the animals. And anyway, as we're as he's telling me this story, the phone rings and when he hangs up he tells me it's a report of hippos being killed in what he thinks is the very same manner for their ivory teeth. Uh-huh. And that moment was really like this epiphany for me because I realized two things. One that this, you know, poisoning or killing for profit was just so pervasive. Yeah. and was not going to stop. And second, that this forensic lab was having this impact 10 years later, you know, even though it wasn't even involved in this case because of the wow. training and because of solving this other case, um, this investigator now knew what to look for. Yeah. And so it just was this epiphany, and it got me started researching the cases. Before that, I hadn't really heard of the lab. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. and. So started researching cases and finding out more and eventually transitioning from working in the field to really writing about this because I realized if I didn't know, you know, here I was in the field and, you know, right in the thick of things, and I didn't realize either how pervasive wildlife trafficking was Mm -hmm. and what was being done to stop it, Mm -hmm. then how could anybody know about it? Yes. Um, yeah, you I, just I mean, don't even realize it. And so my, no. that was my little personal mission was really okay. just to raise awareness. Okay. Because once you're aware, you yourself can, you know, change what you buy, but you can also ask your legislators for, you know, to support the agencies. And once people start talking about it, then the budgets will increase for enforcement and demand will also go down at the same time. So those two <sighs> things happen. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, it, this is just such amazing work, and it will make a huge difference, and it actually gives me hope, you know, that there's something we can actually do uh, to make a difference here and not just feel so powerless and helpless, you know, while these these guys are, you know, just uh, destroying our species, which, by the way, affects the health of our planet. Right. And and there is a lot we can do, and that's what I find empowering is because, okay. to me, the wildlife forensic scientists give these animals a voice. But we make that voice stronger by what we do. So, you know, okay. if we avoid buying exotic pets, okay. that really helps. Okay. If we ask, you know, when you go in a dentist's office and you see this beautiful aquarium displays, if you uh-huh. ask them to instead have um, a different type of display where you can have a webcam or something uh-huh. instead of the aquarium fish, um, all of all of these things actually make a difference. When you go on vacation, you don't even realize it. Like you go to the Caribbean or something and you go to watch the sea turtles and you go mm-hmm. snorkeling and you see the sea turtles and yeah. then you go to the little shop and you see sea turtle shell jewelry uh-huh. and you don't even realize that that's the sea turtle, you know, that you just paid good money to go as a tourist, go see. Enjoy alive, and now you can take a dead carcass part of it home. Right, and you don't even make the connection because they're so separated, and it doesn't necessarily look like what it is. And so if you just start being aware of it, all of a sudden you can start thinking, well, no, I don't want that. Yeah. And and when you say that, somebody else will ask, why not? And you tell them, and then 
Um, and then soon there's no demand for it anymore. Right. So so we can help by voting with our pocketbooks. And if we don't buy this stuff, then they can't move it and they can't order more. Right. In effect, right? So it's right. exactly. the chain of demand. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. And, and the other thing yeah. is the laws are so varied depending on what the item is. So, yeah, you know, elephants, sort of the big the big guys, are protected under the on, uh, via international law, under the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. But there's also a lot that's protected at the state level or at the federal level. Okay. And at the state level, uh, things like black bears, mm. there's, <laughs> um, there's, believe it or not, a big trafficking in the gallbladders of bears mm. because it has uh, medicinal properties and used in traditional Asian medicine. Okay. And my own state of Vermont, it's perfectly legal to buy and sell black bear gallbladders. Lord. But, you know, elsewhere it's not. So someone can use Vermont to launder their bear gallbladders. Uh, and I know I've suggested to my own legislators that that, gets mm-hmm. changed. And in New York, where it's also legal, there's uh-huh. just a bill introduced to change that. So that's all at the local level. Okay. Um, there's, so there's a lot of local level laws that where it's most effective. It's not effective if some big organization comes in and says, change this. What's effective is local people saying, hey, this needs to be changed. And then, okay. So, so there is a lot we can do. Okay. Okay. Ah, so, good Lord, I, um, I'm i not even sure what to ask. I, I know there's a lot more that we need to be aware of. So we've covered, you've covered a few things. So avoid getting exotic pets. That seems real clear. <clears throat> I love your comment about not doing aquarium fish, but actually to put in a live webcam or something like that, which I think is really wonderful. What a cool idea. I never it even is, considered that. Um, it is a cool idea, and it's you know it's relatively new. Yeah. And I did some interviews on the aquarium trade for my own radio show, The Wildlife, and I was floored to learn about the trade. I mean, a lot of it's perfectly legal, mm-hmm. but there's some that's illegal. But what's stunning is that virtually all aquarium fish have to be wild caught, mm. and that a lot of them die along the way before mm. making it into your aquarium. Mm, and yeah. so to me that was stunning, and that alone was a reason to, well, just shift away from it. Yeah. Aside from my own self, not, when I was a kid I had goldfish, and I didn't do that well with them, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 Embarrassingly. Um, <laughs> but yeah. but <laughs> yeah, my, my, uh, my husband, uh, my uh, ex-husband, uh, his first pet was a goldfish and of course they didn't give him any instructions he was enamored of it he overfed it and it was dead the next morning and i tell you oh, it traumatized him for life <laughs> was, he, i don't think he ever got over that it was just awful anyway that's funny and another big area where people can make a huge impact is with orangutans believe it or not oh really yeah. Now, orangutans are threatened partly from the trade, you know, from wildlife trafficking, and mostly uh-huh. as pets. Um, the orphans are, uh-huh. you know, the little babies are so adorable. Yes. Of course, they grow big, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, they do. But, but um, quickly, and, too. And one of the things that helps that trade is actually palm oil plantations. Oh, tell me about and that. I, that's new to me. The palm forest. Okay, tell me. Yeah, so what's happening, um, orangutans are mostly in Indonesia, are are all in Indonesia and Malaysia, and in particular parts. And that's also the areas where palm oil is very big. And palm oil is a cheap, uh, it's an efficient, efficient to produce oil. It's relatively inexpensive, but it's also very um, stable. Mm-hmm. So it's like a good oil to use in cosmetics, in yeah. detergents, yeah. in cookies and spaghetti sauce. You know, it's in mm-hmm. a, so much um, material. It's also used as a biofuel, not so much in the U.S., oh. but Europe. Okay. And 
the problem is that to make these plantations, you don't have to, but you generally clear the clear the land mm-hmm. and burn the land, you know, burn the rainforest and then plant okay. oil palm. Okay. And it takes several years for the oil palm to grow. And while it's growing, what happens is the orangutans are pushed into ever smaller fragments of forest. They're hungry. They come out. They eat oh. the shoots. They destroy the shoots uh, you know, of okay. the new plantations. Okay. That makes okay. the plantation owners furious, yeah. um, and they kill the adults. Oh. And um, and then take the babies and sell the babies because they're so cute. And then also you want the babies anyway for the pet trade. So these two forces are really having this impact in on um, on orangutans. Yeah. And uh, but there is a big push now to look at how the oil palm, you know, the palm oil is produced, and to uh-huh. buy it from sustainably harvested you know, producers. Okay. Okay. And so if people start looking at what they buy, a lot of times it's not even labeled because yeah. a lot of times it's included as just labeled as vegetable oil. Yeah. But certain companies, you know, but to check it out and to ask because a lot of companies haven't even considered it, but once they start getting asked, then all of a sudden they switch like the Girl Scout cookies. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, Wow. And Oreo oh, cookies, yeah. which okay. my son loves, <laughs> you know. And so, but companies are switching. There's a lot now that are switching, like seventh generation, uh, which makes um, like detergents and household cleaning right. products and right. stuff. Um, has switch is switching and has switched and committed to switch. The problem is also okay. where is that the certification process? Okay. So so that you may not be able to actually buy sustainable palm oil yet it just depends um on how much so that's still in. new but it's coming oh. within a year what a and idea. okay but if if uh one of the reasons the girl scout cookies are switching is because of two young girl scouts who found out about this and started yeah pushing so it's a really uplifting story that wow. you know little kids you know just asking questions uh huh. Asking where it came from. Unilever has switched. The whole co- country of the Netherlands, um, which has great chocolate, <laughs> uh, yes, you know, has do. also made a uh-huh. commitment. Uh-huh. So, so you are making this big, big okay. difference. Okay. So, for our favorite companies, if we notice palm oil in the ingredient label, we should actually contact them and ask them to uh, get their palm oil from sustainably harvested palm uh, growers. Right, and if awesome. and if it just says vegetable that. oil and it uh-huh. doesn't specify, uh-huh. ask if it's palm oil. Yeah, okay. Because the more people that ask, even if you don't go anywhere else except ask, hey, do you use palm oil? That's going to make the company think, oh, people actually are people thinking about this. Notice and are actually caring enough to speak up. Wow, because, maybe we should do something. Yeah, yeah, because so okay. few, so few do that. Even if just ten people do it. Mm-hmm. Okay. That makes a difference in the company's wow mindset. Honestly, like ten people can have this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and, and you know what they say is that you know if for every one person that speaks up, there are hundreds or thousands that that didn't. You know, but they feel the same way. They just haven't somehow voiced their concern yet. So right. I think the companies are wise to do that. Oh, how this is exciting. Um so so what else can we do, Laurel? Anything? What else can you do? Well, you're probably not going to buy a pet tiger. <laughs> With, no. Uh, believe it or not. Probably not. You. I would like to have one, but no, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> I'll buy a picture. <laughs> but when you go to a zoo uh-huh. or uh-huh. when you go touring around, there's a lot of like privately owned mm-hmm. things Sometimes they're called sanctuaries, but a lot of times the cats are being kept or other animals in bad conditions. And so that's an area where, you know, people can also make a difference. Again, just by asking, just by asking questions and noticing, that makes a difference as well. And also just telling other friends um, when you see things being done well um, on Facebook or Twitter um, to remark about it. Okay. And when you see things being done poorly, uh-huh. to remark about that as well, because it's amazing how much social media can play a role. There was a big, um, mm. in Hong Kong, like shark fins are traded, 
and some of it's legal, a lot of it's legal, perfectly legal. Um, but it's having this huge impact on the species, on a number of different shark species. Yeah. Um, Seventy-three million sharks are killed each year just yeah. for their fins. It's Aww. just a huge, huge trade. And there was a big attempt to, um, at the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, also known as CITES, to protect these species. And it didn't pass, uh-huh. but I'm sure at some point it will because soon there won't be any left. Uh, yeah, by the time we wake up and pay attention, it's kind of too late. Right, and yeah. there was a bank mm-hmm. in Hong Kong that mm-hmm. for um, that was giving like a for you know like a promotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, for was I think it was Citibank, but I'm not positive about that. Um, okay. That was that was for a promotion promoting um, shark fin soup. Oh, because mm-hmm. it's a delicacy and yeah. whatnot, uh-huh. and there was such an uproar, it pulled Ooh. it. Oh, thank you, God, uh, because uh, of social huh? media. Wow. Um, another example was with bear bile, where there was a push to in in China. This one was where uh, there was going to be a public offering, you know, like on the stock exchange, uh-huh. on a local stock exchange for a bear bile farm. Oh. Which then then the money used would be used to expand. And so, of course. But again, this outroar, you know, this this social media protesting against it, uh huh, and making people aware of it is changing how things work. So people wow. are having an impact on what's going on. A recent one was um, GoDaddy. dot com. The mm-hmm. CEO uh, went on a hunt. It was a, a legal hunt. And he killed elephant and leopard uh, in Zimbabwe, and the elephant for food for the villagers because it had been raiding crops. And there's been big, been this huge debate about it. Uh-huh. Um, he he had posted a video on mm. it, mm. and um, but again, there's this uh, this social media, you know, on both pros and cons, and it, it, whether or not you agree or disagree with yeah. the action. The discussion is really important, and it makes yeah. people aware, and it makes people aware that, uh, you know, ask the question, what's happening to the ivory? What, right. you know, and so all of that raises a lot of questions, and I think that awareness is really good. Mm. Thank you. Well, I am more aware now, definitely. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I'm, let's change the topic just a little bit. Um, can you tell us something funny or maybe potentially embarrassing so we can uh, better understand some of what you've been into or involved in? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, aside from my personal foibles of, like, burning food all the time, I'm not oh. the best of cooks. <laughs> I, I have a terrible my, – my nine-year-old son is much better. Um, <laughs> but, okay. But – What's what's funny is since I've been doing, since I've done this book and, you know, continue to write about wildlife trade issues, um, everybody now is giving me their their dead animals and parts and products that they find, which on the one hand is lovely, on the other hand is disgusting and terrible. I mean, it was very, it was very funny because when my book came out, uh-huh. and I was having dinner with some friends, and um, they had worked on international development like I had for a long time. That's how we knew each other. And and um, and he's saying, "Hey, you could borrow one of my skulls." He has this amazing collection of skulls and things because he lived in the Serengeti for a while. Wow! In the seventies, and so mm-hmm. you know they'd come across clean skulls, mm-hmm. you know, of all sorts of things. So he's like, oh, here, you can take this lion skull. It'll be great when you go give your dog. And, you know, and so he gave it. And I thought that was such a great, I actually thought that was such a great idea because it's much easier to see, like, what a tooth looks like when you actually have the tooth we well, yeah, to look, look at, at it. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, so I borrowed these skulls from him, and I think to myself, I cracked me up because I'm like, who else has friends with skulls, you know? Uh-huh. Oh, and, wow. <laughs> and, um, and then for my birthday, and then I, I didn't want to travel with his skulls. 
uh-huh. you know, because they're quite valuable too. And yeah, um, yeah. so my husband for my birthday bought me some skulls. Uh-huh. He bought me um, like replica skulls. <laughs> replica, you oh, know, well, like that's like uh, you know, like teaching type uh, skulls. You know, that sure, are yeah, made yeah, out yeah. of plastic or whatever. Right, 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 right. What, what so that I use I use those instead okay. of my friends. <laughs> yeah, so that's, it's a little embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's too funny. Oh, but, I love it, love it. But, Thank you. We had one, um, yeah, we had one bobcat. I I live in Vermont in a rural area, and um, a bobcat had just died on our property, and Mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out why. It was like a forensic mystery, right? Mm -hmm. And and it was a young one, so it was very curious because it was in October, and I was very sad. And um, I found out it had died of malnutrition, which was very odd because we have tons of prey around for it. Wow. Um, And so I found, I learned that, um, that, a lot of bobcat have like a parasite in their belly so that they can't oh. digest it. So they can be eating, but they won't, oh. you know, digest it. Oh, uh, okay. And so that's probably what happened to this one. But I, I did have that. Um, I thought so it wouldn't be a total loss. Like I was so depressed. So depressed. It just yeah. was so, um, yeah. so depressing. Even though we happen to have a lot of bobcat around, mm-hmm. but um, so I do. That's the one real skull I use is like a tribute to mm, okay. him. And then the cover of my book, too, is like a tribute so that the deaths aren't in vain. Yeah, just, yeah. So. Well, you know what? You mentioned the cover of the book. Tell me about the cover of the book. Um, it's, just, well, it's such a striking image. It, it's it's just, I mean, what are we looking at? Is that a wolverine? No, it's a an Asiatic black bear. Oh. And it was taken, it was a rescued bear. Okay. And um, it, his name is Chengdu Truth. Okay. And he was rescued from a farm in China where the bears are kept for, you know, years and years, 20 years in these horrid conditions in, like, oh. coffin-sized cages. It's oh. so tragic. I can oh. barely speak oh. about it. Oh, God. But the upside is that the bears, um, Animals Asia Foundation ha- is rescuing those bears and in fact, for Mother's Day, my husband got me. Here's another embarrassing thing: um, <laughs> some some equipment. You know, it's very expensive to rescue bears and then make sure that they're entertained and whatnot. So he bought a swing yeah. for a bear for my. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's in China, but you know, you can donate to Animals Asia Foundation, and that oh, was my wow. Mother's Day gift. <laughs> like a, oh, a bear wow. swing. <laughs> I love that. That is so cool. So you got a, you, I got a bear swing. You got a bear swing. I'm probably the only mom around who, who's excited to get a bear swing in Asia for Mother's Day. I, I don't know. I would be excited too. Oh wow! Um, gracious. And so that yeah, and so that bear. Um, to me, it's like a tribute. He actually died okay. of liver cancer, which is a common problem when yeah. the bears are milked of their bile for 20 years. Oh. But a lot of them have survived. They have a well over 200 bears who have been rescued. And in Vietnam, it's the same. They're doing the same thing and having great success and closing down all sorts of bear farms. And, oh, thank um, you. Thank you. Thank so you. it's a really positive mm-hmm. story. Oh, man, I love that. What a good story. Oh. Thank you. I'm so glad I asked about that. It's such an <laughs> unusual and touching picture. Huh. So let's talk just for a little bit. I want I want to better understand how wildlife forensics crime labs actually work. So y'all use like fingerprints and, and tire tracks and bullets and gunshot residue and poisons and DNA and all that kind of stuff. It, I mean, how, how does it actually work? It's just, it's just stunning to me. And amazing. Can you give us a little insight? Into yeah, the process? so it's really it's really interesting. You know, and it, it's very similar to you know human forensics labs. Okay. Um, you know, you have the evidence comes in. There's like a stainless steel window, and it gets checked in. The agent either brings it in or mails it in. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know, evidence just identifying it because chain of custody is really important. Yeah. And I, sh- I should mention that one big difference between, like, the wildlife forensics that you see on, like, CSI mm-hmm. and real forensics is that the forensic scientists don't in- get involved in investigating the cases. Ah. And that neutrality 
is so important because the science, the power of the science and mm-hmm. the power of their findings mm-hmm. is that it's neutral. Okay. And so in 98% of the cases, you know, the criminals plead out when the forensic lab is involved and has found that the item being trafficked was a protected species. Okay. The science is so reliable because the scientists are neutral. And okay. they find, one of the cases in my book, actually finds the defendant not guilty. Wow. And because the science is neutral, um, everybody was sure he, and it's unclear whether the defendant actually knew <laughs> whether he was trafficking bogus, bogus stuff, <laughs> but he was. Okay, <laughs> so okay. He, um, now, in, with some species, it doesn't matter whether or not it's real or not, because even just the thought of it is mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. is a problem. So it depends on the law. But okay, but um, okay. So it depends. Uh, but anyway, so so the investigators are separate from the forensic scientists. So you don't have okay. like the scientists asking questions of the of the poachers or anything like that, okay. or doing okay. any investigation. They just simply find out the legal questions. So the human and wildlife forensics, at their heart, forensics, the definition of forensics is that they're, they use science to answer a legal question. That's what forensics is, whether it's oh, human okay. or wildlife. That's and so okay. they're, they're also similar in that they also link a crime or a crime scene to a suspect and a victim. Okay. You know, the main difference is that wildlife forensics deals with thousands of species when when human forensics deals just with one. Yes. And oh, so wow. wildlife mm-hmm. forensics, like I was saying earlier, has this extra job of figuring out what the victim is. Okay. So a piece of evidence comes in, but unlike human forensics, typically there's no body. I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes there is. Um, yeah. There's a lot of wolf, wolf cases and things uh, that come in. And some, okay. so sometimes there's a body, but a lot of times uh, – the victim's been, you know, sliced and diced into a processed product Mm -hmm. that looks nothing like the animal it came from. And so then the lab really has to do three things. So it comes in, it goes to the evidence room, and then depending on what it is, it will go to the appropriate scientists. So if it's a bird-related item, it will go to the forensic ornithologist. If it's teeth, it goes to one of the morphologists who you know, specialize in that. If it's related to reptiles, it goes to the herpetologist. So mm-hmm. it just depends oh, wow. what what it is. And sometimes the same piece of evidence might be analyzed by several parts mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of the lab. Wow. And so, okay. so from there, the lab basically does three things. Um, it has to find a unique characteristic of the animal and the part in question. Okay. So something unique. So with a feather, it would be the color, the shape, the size, whatever. Um, you know, other times with a bear's gallbladder, it's it's the uh, chemical composition of the of the bile. In this okay. case, the levels of three bile acids. So you have to find something that's unique okay. that's only relevant to that species. Got it. Okay. And for that, you actually have to know rule out all the other species. So. You know, you you need to know what makes a bear's gallbladder unique. You actually, oh wow, you know, have to have to research it. So sometimes, so, and then you also have to compare it to known specimens. Okay. So you have to prove that, yeah, every bear in the world, you know, will have three unique levels of bile acids that are identifying. It's it's it doesn't matter. All bears have this. Okay. And then you also have to develop a method to detect that characteristic consistently. Mm, okay. So for each part of each species, that characteristic might differ, differ and that method might be different, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so so that's basically what the lab will do is take take a piece of evidence and sort of sometimes if they've seen it before, then it becomes you just use the protocol that was originally established. But, okay. okay. And it doesn't have to be that particular lab that can do it. Anybody can do it. But the the problem is finding what's unique about this. And so once an item gets trafficked, Mm -hmm. if it's one of the first cases, then you're like, I don't know what makes it unique. No, we got to figure (laughs) that out because we don't have the methodology and the protocol already set. This is new territory. Right. And so, and that's where it's exciting for a young person to study this is because unfortunately, and it's fortunate and unfortunate, you know, unfortunately there's a ton of species out there 
yeah. that are being trafficked and once you solve once you start enforcing on one species you go to another one like spotted cats you know mm-hmm. once you know that you can identify leopards and cheetah and jaguar and the big cats then all of a sudden you start to there's trade switches to the smaller spotted cats right so and so is, people are always switching yeah um and so but that means oh you need to develop new methods new identification and so mm-hmm. you know some, one of your listeners could be the person that discovers that. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's also what's really exciting is that this is a, a brand new, really, in a lot of ways, a new field. It really you know, is. Uh, and and it's, it's so important. And so far, um, there, there's no under... It, it's starting to become where you start to have a few classes at universities within forensics programs or within mm-hmm. biology programs. Mm-hmm. There mm-hmm. is um, a forensics, animal forensics program at University of Florida okay. um, focused on actually on um, animal abuse cases mm. okay. and domestic abuse issues. And so, and that's um, done jointly with a, American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Okay. And it's so that's one of the only actual standing in fact I think it is the only uh university program, but otherwise you take what you know from biology, anthropology, archaeology, um zoology, forensics mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. mush it all together and so people come out of all these various fields and get training on the ground. I love it. I'm so glad to know that uh, you and and, uh, all the others responsible for helping save our species and our planet, um, you know, and and preserve wildlife and conserve, um, I'm so glad that you're doing the job you're doing. It's so, so critically important. Oh, it just touches my heart. I oh. Goodness. Well, I appreciate I appreciate all your caring, and I think that's the main thing is once you know humans are really ingenious, and once you know that there's a problem, yeah, and you care enough about it, yes, it won't stick around. <laughs> no, we can solve it. We can solve it together um, if we want to. You know, I, I, it's a wonderful quote about um, you know we we save what we treasure. You know, we we. Um, protect what we value, you know. So and and we and we do. Uh, there are a lot of animal lovers in the world, and we do value um, our, our wildlife. So, oh, thank you. So, so what should our listeners do next, Laurel? Well, it would be great if they could just share the information with their friends and family. You know, yes. Link mm-hmm. link to this podcast right. on on Facebook or, you know, tweet about it. Um, check yeah, out some yeah. of the many organizations working on wildlife trade issues. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a number of them out there that are really, really good. Wildlife rehabilitation is another uh-huh. area because, like I said, there's, um, there is a lot of illegal trade also in live animals. So there's a yeah. number of groups that do great wildlife rehabilitation and are releasing these animals back mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. into um, the wild. I, I know um, a lot about that personally. I used to work with wildlife rescue and re- rehabilitation here in our area. Um, did a lot of work with the animals there. Mm-hmm. And it's, oh, it's amazing. And it's it's very intense and very intricate because yes. you can't just let, <clears throat> let them go. <laughs> no, no, and they need volunteers. So um, if you have any inclination at all, you know, contact. If you have a wildlife rescue facility in your area, give them support as they need a lot of support. It's a very hard and sometimes dangerous and difficult task, um, but an important one. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, that's some things they can do. Anything else? And um, contact their, you know, their representatives. Okay. At the at the federal level. Okay. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Service um, Law Enforcement Branch is, you know, within the Department of Interior. It's underfunded, okay. understaffed. There's okay. less than 200 special agents working on this across the whole country. Mm-hmm. Um, they also have, you know, slightly more than 100 wildlife inspectors at all the ports and whatnot. And if legislators know that it's important or that, truthfully, that the issue even exists, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, all of a sudden you'll, I think you'll start seeing a budget that's a little bit more supportive okay. and also you'll see prosecutors more willing to take on these cases. Right now, a lot of prosecutors just have in their mind that, oh, it's not worth 
you know, worth the trouble of taking on a case mm-hmm. uh, related to animals. And so that's mm-hmm. a, always an uphill battle, but I think the more people mm-hmm. are aware of it, okay. Um, the better. And a lot of times you don't even know where you're, you know, you mention it to your mom, your mom mentions it to, you know, the neighbor, and the neighbor mentions it to their cousin who is a prosecutor or, uh-huh. you know, and so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. You don't yeah. know, you don't even know where these little tidbits travel to. And right. And, yeah, good. And, and we don't know, you know, when we speak up and give a voice to our passion, to our concern, you know, and start, like you said, asking questions, um, then the others pay attention. You know, they'll also voice. They'll will join together, and we can make a difference. We can. And change. I bet once your listeners have heard this show, mm-hmm. all of a sudden they start. They will start to notice. It, it's funny because my mom, she'll always call me up. Hey, did you see the? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, that all of a sudden you start to. And my editor too started sending me all these articles because all of a sudden you start to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And you you didn't even notice it before. I mean, I'm like that too. You start to just notice it, yeah. Um, all around, and you're like, wow, it's really taking off. And part of it is it's taking off, but a lot of it is you're just now aware of it, so you're mm-hmm. noticing mm-hmm. what's happening. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. And the more, <laughs> like you said earlier, one of the things we have to do is become more consciously aware, right? To be aware. And I, I know some of the things you had said. Uh, don't buy exotic pets. Um, you've made a note here that said that if we do, if we just have to have <laughs> that creature, be, uh, make sure that they're actually captive bred um, and be sure. I'm, I would say that you're taking a very good job of giving them a good, healthy, happy life. Um, so you're responsible for that. <clears throat> and then don't buy items made from protected species, right? Um, right. And ask questions to find out. Uh, if they actually are. So don't just buy things because they're pretty or seem rare or unusual because they probably are and not in a good way. (laughs) So, yeah, anything else? Yeah, when you, you know, I I think that's a great list. And I think, you know, the more people just question if you see some celebrity wearing, you know, (laughs) something Uh that Uh raises questions, asking the question, um, believe it or not, there was a CSI show and uh-huh. one of the criminals had had a, a tank with fish in it and it turned out there were trafficked animals in that tank. Wow. And um it was solely because someone had called and said, Hey, I saw this C S I and it had that and they reviewed the tape uh-huh. and it turned out and it was unknown. You know, people wow. didn't know realize that they were having it, but there was an investigation. Yes, they uh-huh. were trafficked, it was part of this ring and uh-huh. you know, but but the people didn't know, the producers mm-hmm. didn't know that that was the case. So, yes. Wow. Just oh, how, that's, that's, oh, that is so exciting. So that's that's just a great story. I love that. <laughs> I'm going to be paying more attention now when I watch my favorite shows, too. And you're okay. going to start to pick up on it. You're going to start to yeah. notice things. And yeah. Yeah. I know I've contacted investigators about a couple things um, okay. that have turned out to be fairly big uh, okay. because I just noticed them and something seemed off. And Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's at your state level as well as federal level. Don't feel yeah. there's right. So if something feels off, everybody, um, take action. Speak up. <laughs> Find out. Right. Empower right. yourself. Ask questions. Ask Just questions. Ask questions. Yeah. Well, and I know too that everyone should have a copy of your fabulous book. Um, again, the title is Animal Investigators: How the World's First Wildlife Forensics Lab is Solving Crimes and Saving Endangered Species. Our author today is Laurel Nemi. Thank you, Laurel. Um, so your book is on Amazon, and I'm sure it's elsewhere also. Um, what else can they do? And um, you can also go on my website, which oh, is laurelnemi.com. Okay, and, and then, go ahead. You can comment on my book or send me an email if you have mm-hmm. questions. I um, love to speak to school groups and libraries okay. and other institutions. It's always it's always fun for me to help um, raise awareness on this. So it's something I love doing. And I also do Skype visits, which are really um, effective, believe it or not. I'm entering the world of technology. <laughs> no. I've entered. <laughs> I mean, it's yes. not as okay. good as in person, but it uh-huh. makes it accessible. And uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, so I'd love to hear from people. And there's a ton of information on my website and links as well cool. to okay. so, more information. So, everybody, your website is laurelnemi.com. I'm going to spell it 
L-A-U-R-E-L-N-E-M-E.com. So laurelneme.com. Um, email you, contact you, have uh, ask you to come speak to their, their groups, their other concerned animal lovers, and anyone and everyone who needs to know, definitely. Um, let's see. Uh, one other thing I know they can uh, also might be interested in is your radio show, The Wildlife. Um, and that is, um, where, where is that again? So that's um, broadcast on a station in Burlington, Vermont, WOMMLP, 105.9 FM okay. in Burlington. It's also available on iTunes, and you can find it through my website. Uh, and every week I have different scientists and other wildlife investigators. So I do a lot on wildlife crime. I've, I've done, cool. I do a lot on science and also just good, fun stuff. Um, it doesn't really deal with domestic animals too much, okay. but it deals with, it does deal with pets, uh, exotic pets, and also um, cool. okay. lots of wild, everything from lorises to tigers to parrots. <laughs> wow. wow. Butterflies. Oh, great. <laughs> We've got it's it. It's so fun. Okay. And if you have an idea, just shoot me an email. <laughs> okay. I love that. Laurel, you've been a delight. I'm so excited to talk to you. This is such good information and great. It's like I could just feel your passion and your mission and, oh. and, and making a difference in our world and saving these species and, and helping with this situation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me on, and thank you for all you do, because you really make a difference. Thank you. Okay, kindred spirit, soul sister. Um, <laughs> I think I think we're a bit probably over time here. and it's Sorry sort of about that. Say, it was really a delight. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Well, keep us informed with what's going on, and we're looking forward to hearing what's next. And by the way, I did see something about you writing another book, so let us know. Oh, and, uh, thank you. I yeah, about that one, too. <laughs> Much, Val. It's You're really welcome. great to get to know Thanks you, well. and um, okay. and let's keep in touch. <laughs> you bet we will. Okay, thank you. I'll talk to you later. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye. Bye.